all of the community boards. Um, when I call your community board, please your, state your name to verify or through audio that you are present. Okay. Good morning. This is Tammy Meltzer from Community Board One. Thank you. Thank you. Community Board Two. Community Board Three. Good morning. This is Trevor Holland for Community Board Three. I am uh, subbing in for Alicia Cole. Community Board Four. Good morning. Jeffrey LaFrancois from Community Board Four, first vice chair for Lowell Kern. Hi, Rosie. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, community Board 5. Good morning. This is Craig Slutskin, the Secretary from Community Board 5. I'm pinch hitting for Vicki Barbero. Nice to see you, Greg. Thanks, Rosie. Um, community Board 6. Good morning. Kyle Othaid from Community Board 6. And congratulations on your first solo full board meeting. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, borough board meeting. Community Board 7. Good morning, Mark Diller, Community Board 7. Good to see you. Good morning, Mark. Community Board 8. Good morning, Rosie. Hi, everyone. Alita Camp, Community Board 8. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Cicely Harris, Community Board 10. Community Board 11. Good morning, Rosie. Xavier Santiago, Vice Chair, Community Board 11. Just finishing drop off for the kids. Community Board 12. Hey, good morning, y'all. Uh, Eliezer Bueno from Community Board 12. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so do, do I hear a motion to accept the minutes from October 15th, 2020 as written? So moved. So moved. <laughs> so moved. Hi, Rosie. I'm here too. Carter from CB2. Carter. Hey. Okay. Um, Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? Anyone abstaining? Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion to accept the agenda for today, November 19th, 2020? So moved. so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Anyone abstaining or against? What against? Okay. Um, the ayes have it on both. We are ready to um, move forward with a presentation from DCP. Um, this is a matter that we will be voting on next month. But next month, we also have another presentation from DCP on East Harlem. So we thought we split them up so we don't get um, land use overload, if that's possible. Um, and I see Danielle DeServo is here. Danielle, are you going to be doing the presentation? I'm going to be I'm going to be handing it over uh, to our team. Um, but uh, we have other team members uh, here to start with you. We have uh, Eric Bosford, who's going to be speaking first, and then uh, going to our resiliency staff. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, whoever's ready to start speaking on the presentation, uh, just unmute and we can start. Are they here? Are they both here? Hi, good morning. This is Eric Bosford from uh, Manhattan Office of the Department of City Planning. And uh, we are joined by uh, members of our uh, waterfront urban design team, uh, as well as the Manhattan office. Obviously, Danielle and James from uh, City Planning are here as well. Um, actually, I am going to hand it over right away to um, Manuela. To uh, Manuela, you're handling the presentation this morning. Is that, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. ASCA will provide you all any introduction. And then I'll, I'll follow up with the text. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here today, and while ASCA is putting the presentation up, 
We are here to provide you a presentation on zoning for coastal flood resiliency. It is a citywide text amendment that was just referred out on October 19th. So we are uh, in the process of referral to all 59 community boards since it's a citywide text amendment. And uh, this is really work that we've been doing since Hurricane Sandy. Um, I, you may recall that right after the storm, we passed two uh, temporary text amendments on an emergency basis, really to be able to advance the recovery process from the storm. And we need to make those uh, provisions permanent since they are about to expire once FEMA adopts the new flood insurance rate maps. And so this work here is really, uh, you know, making those provisions that have been very helpful to advance uh, resiliency in the building scale uh, so we don't lose that, uh, that allowances, the set of allowances uh, to achieve resiliency moving forward. And also to do some updates that we heard from uh, our outreach process, we were really engaging on a citywide scale uh, with all the community boards, uh, most of the community boards, uh, the elected officials, uh, the, the community with the AIAs, the technical community, uh, and community members as well with our workshop. So, so I hope that uh, we will provide you a quick overview and then we will definitely be available for a Q&A. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having us at this meeting. And thank you to many of you who have been part of this work in the years since Hurricane Sandy. Zoning for Coastal Flood Resiliency is proposes updates to the zoning resolutions, Article 6, Chapter 4, and other related sections. We are going to go through a brief overview of what is really a very detailed text zoning amendment that improves upon the existing zoning text and makes it permanent. If you want to hear more information about any of the proposal, you can stay for questions or you can look at a detailed project summary and the entire annotated tech zoning text at nyc.gov slash zcfr. And we can follow up on any questions we can't answer today. Commissions, um, so what we're asking for is your recommendations for the City Planning Commission about this proposal. Official recommendations from all 59 community boards, borough boards, and borough presidents are requested by December 28th. Um, I will start with a brief introduction to provide an overview of the current regulatory framework and what we've learned about zoning issues from community outreach, as Manuela mentioned. And then Manuela will then present the proposal in four separate sections, highlighting the project's four main goals. While there are many sources of flooding that pose issues in New York City, coastal storms present the most significant flood risk in terms of compromising human safety, property damage, and business disruption. With 520 miles of coastline, New York is very much a coastal city. When we're analyzing the city's coastal risk, we tend to focus on the area that FEMA designates as the high-risk flood zone or the area that has a 1% chance of flooding, However, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy awakened us to a more widespread risk by inundating well beyond that area. Close to half of New York City's population is classified um, as being moderate risk of flooding or having 0.2% um, chance of flooding. And in the two areas combined, almost a million New Yorkers live at risk of being flooded by a coastal storm. And with climate change, the flood plain will continue to expand. By 2050s, today's moderate risk flood zone will likely be high risk for flooding. I also want to point out that while this map is zoomed into Manhattan for the purpose of this presentation, this is a citywide text amendment and the city's flood plain is very diverse. Um, and what, the, what that means is that the neighborhoods within the floodplain have unique challenges to stay safe and meet current flood risk regulations, and this text amendment has to accommodate these varying neighborhoods. Since the text amendment has a citywide application and the board is asked to comment on the totality of the text, this presentation might show some building typologies that are not typical of Manhattan, like single-family detached homes. The wide range of challenges that come with flood risk adaptation require strategies that involve multiple lines of defense. The city's work includes coastal defense strategies like the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, which most of you here are probably familiar with. It also includes protection over inland infrastructures, 
like drainage and transit, and advanced emergency preparedness. This tax amendment is just one of these many lines of defenses and focus specifically on improving resiliency in the city's building stock. So it, this, the focus of this text will be mostly about how to make those buildings more resilient. And in order to understand how this text promotes that, we have first have to understand the New York City Building Code. Regulations based on FEMA standards for buildings in the flood zone are located in Appendix G of the New York City Building Code. Compliance with such rules are generally required for new and significantly modified existing buildings constructed in the flood zone. The zoning resolution is then an added layer that is meant to accommodate these regulations while also improving neighborhoods. Looking first at the New York City Building Code requirements, they are based on the building's location within the flood zone and what the building co code calls the design flood elevation or DFE, which can be seen in the blue dotted line here. DFE is the height that flood waters could be expected to rise plus freeboard or additional elevation for protection. So for residential buildings, all living spaces must be located at or above the DFE. Any space below must be wet flood proofed, meaning it is designed to allow water to flow in and out. These wet flood proof spaces may only be used for parking, storage and access, and buildings can't, may not have any living spaces below ground. For non-residential or mixed use buildings, um, the, the, they can be designed with the same wet flood proofing methods, but they also have the option to dry flood proof and locate some uses below the DFE. Dry flood proofing means meeting specific design and material requirements so that water cannot enter the building during a flood event. This strategy allows uses to be located close to the sidewalk level, but it can be expensive and especially challenges in locations with high water tables or high DFEs. These building code regulations became widely applicable soon after the storm, but posed conflicts with the zoning resolution in three main ways. Rules that govern location of uses, bulk regulations that govern the size and shape of buildings, and finally, how resilient buildings interface with the public realm. That is where this text comes in. It builds on the two previous zoning text amendments that were put in place shortly after Hurricane Sandy and removes barriers within the zoning resolution that make it hard for new and existing buildings in the plain to meet the building code requirements for flood resistant construction. Ultimately, zoning for coastal flood resiliency will help with those living and working in the floodplain to reduce damage from future coastal storms, be resilient in the long term by accounting for future risks for climate change, potentially help save on flood insurance costs, and would also assist with disaster recovery by setting a framework for emergency situations, including the present situation with COVID-19. The two text amendments that the city adopted post Sandy on an emergency basis helped address these issues. However, these rules are already expiring. If these rules are not made permanent through this text, it could hinder the protection of existing vulnerable buildings and disincentivize resiliency measures in new constructions, making our neighborhoods less resilient. Through several years, we conducted citywide research about resiliency strategies of different building types and studied 10 neighborhoods that were severely impacted by the storm. From this work, we gathered insights from stakeholders and partner city agencies, which helped us uncover additional zoning barriers to resilient construction. We took our public engagement further and briefed more than 3,000 stakeholders across all boroughs through different forms of outreach, such as presentations to elected officials in the technical community, community workshops, and other types of public events. Our community workshops were key in identifying neighborhood priorities and, and individual needs regarding making buildings safe to coastal storms. Our goal was twofold. One, to educate the community on flood risk and the range of regulations that are required and available to them in the flood zone. And two, learn from residents of the technical community how they envision the buildings where they live, work, or help design being more resilient. 
As a result of this extensive outreach, we have learned valuable lessons which helped inform the zoning for coastal flood resiliency text. We realized that our previous rules were predominantly focused on low density residential areas. They mostly assisted buildings that can be physically elevated, such as detached houses. However, they were not enough in assisting um, residents relocate all living spaces above the DFE or over elevate the lowest floor above future flood levels. Attached homes and multifamily buildings were not sufficiently addressed since they must evacuate spaces below D the DFE and relocate them on the top of the structure, a retrofit strategy that requires more flexibility. And businesses were also not sufficiently addressed as they need high visibility from sidewalks, but also because many rely heavily on sellers and uh, being at grade for operations. The rules also did not assess, assist all types of communities across the city's floodplain. Certain older neighborhoods that don't match our current rules, either use or bulk regulations, did not get enough relief to make buildings more resilient. Rules that gave additional height and allowed certain spaces to be exempted from floor area varied by the flood level, leading to unintended and inequitable outcomes, such as resilient buildings being built out of scale for the neighborhood or loopholes in the text that allowed developers to make buildings bigger, but not necessarily resilient. Our street, streetscape regulations also had inconsistent and insufficient applicability, particularly in medium and high density districts. And lastly, we realized that there are rules that need to be readily available quickly after a disaster strikes. So this text amendment could be one way to get closer to the city's overall disaster preparedness. These are all lessons learned since the flood text was initially introduced in 2013. Now Manuela will briefly go through the proposal to describe how this text addresses these issues while encouraging our buildings to be more resilient. Thank you so much, Aska. That was a great introduction overview. Um, so after a long process of studying the flow plane and engaging with so many stakeholders, as Aska was mentioning, uh, in the community on a wide set of issues, we were able to establish four overarching goals that really help us move from sandy recovery to a longer term resilience strategy. So first of all, the floodplain community wants to be able to prepare buildings for flooding, even if they're not located in what FEMA currently determines to be the highest risk flood zone. People also want the option to raise living spaces higher than the current flood level that FEMA projects because they've seen higher flood levels already with Sandy and expect that risk to grow in the future with sea levels rising and therefore the expected flood level in the event of a storm. Residents and business owners want to be able to invest in resiliency incrementally so it's more affordable to them over time. They want options like moving their mechanical equipment to a higher elevation without necessarily triggering a requirement to raise or fully flood proof the structure. And lastly, we know that we need a way for the city to be nimbler in responding to future events that might require rebuilding homes or even other forms of recovery. So now for each goal, I will be presenting a set of strategies that help achieve them and go over a selection of regulations that we are proposing, which are mostly applicable in Manhattan. Next slide. So starting with applicability, this first goal really speaks to where the proposed zoning text would apply. These regulations are optional to help buildings undertake resilience improvements. So again, we are responding to regulations that come from the federal level adopted by the city's building code and we offer flexibility so no one is uh, facing any hindrances in meeting those regulations. Next slide. So to speak about applicability of the text, uh, most of it applies to the city's floodplain. So the CFR would be expanding the applicability of the current text to a broader set of buildings that are also exposed to flooding in the event of coastal storms today. Any lot located within either the high risk or moderate risk floodplains will be allowed to use the proposed special options for resilient building design. In one parenthesis here, an important thing to note is that the 0.2% floodplain serves as a proxy for the high end projection of the 2050s 1% annual chance floodplain so the future high-risk flood zone, really allowing the city to advance resiliency in the long term, starting now. Next slide. The second goal illustrates options that would be available only if the building fully meets or even exceeds Appendix G of the building code. 
These are split into five separate strategies and I'll focus on the first three for Manhattan. Next slide. So more streamlined optional rules for how height is measured in the flow plane would allow building owners to physically elevate aptable spaces and other building support features above expected flow elevations. So they are safe in the longer term. Currently, the 2013 flow text already allows maximum height to be measured from the design flow elevation and even allow extra height in situations where buildings are located in areas with high expected flood elevations. This extra height allows buildings to have a more useful ground floor, and we learned that over time, it also helps with long-term resiliency. Today, building heights can be bumped to 9, 10, or 12 feet, and here I'm showing the 10 and 12, which is, are applicable to Manhattan, depending on the building's use and the zoning district, making really a highly complex framework. Because the applicability also depends upon the flood elevation height, slight topographic changes along sometimes even the same street can lead to inconsistent outcomes. So the proposal will make uh, those height allowances more consistent and actively distributed by allowing heights to be measured from a new reference plane that can be placed up to 10 feet above grade in the 1% flood plane and up to 5 feet in the 0.2% flood plane, so further inland. Next slide. So to help promote safer buildings um, in, with good long-term resilient design, it's important to know here that we are also making sure that the proposal is not continuing to allow a loophole that we flagged through our outreach process. So while now we already have these extra height allowances in the flow plane, there isn't a requirement that the second story of the building is placed at that level or even higher. So what we are doing is we are uh, actually reducing in some areas the high flexibility from 12 to 10 and making sure that the first floor level of the first floor above the flow elevation has to be placed at or above the reference plane. So only buildings that are really future proofing will be able to take advantage of the high flexibility. Next slide. And to continue to help promote safer buildings with good long-term resilient design and good neighborhood streetscapes, Proposal would also conduct small changes to existing ground floor regulations. Proposal would allow existing floor area exemption for spaces that are wet flow proofed to apply to both existing and new buildings. Since this space is pursuant to building code as Asko was mentioning, can only be used for parking storage and building access. This allowance really helps support buildings that adapt to climate change. And just a note that, you know, we already have this regulation in the book and we're just making sure that all buildings can, can use it. Next slide. The current rules that we have today also include flyer exemptions for spaces that are dry flow proofed. This is to promote active uses to be kept at the street level. However, there are two set of rules. On your left, you can see a provision that applies to existing buildings, which could exempt the entire dry flow proof space. On the right, you can see a rule that applies to new and existing buildings, which allowed any space to be exempted from floor area if more than half of the floor is below the flow level. We call the spaces cellars. You are all probably familiar with cellars below grade, but in the flow plane, a cellar can be a space entirely above grade, provided, as I said, more than half is located below the flow level. This rule was first implemented in 1989, so it has been there for several decades. And then it was edited by the 2013 flow text to make it even more flexible. The problem with the seller exemption system is that, first of all, it allowed full floors to be entirely exempted without actually requiring the building to comply with resiliency standards. So this is another loophole that was flagged to us. It also encouraged squished ground floors with low ceiling heights and sunken ground floors, which are extremely vulnerable. Ultimately, these two exemptions ended up promoting buildings out of scale and ground floors that were less marketable and effective for active uses. So in the next slide, I'll show what the proposal is doing. So the proposal will be modifying these regulations to reduce the amount of floor area that can be exempted to instead only allow the first 30 feet of a space that is dry flow proofed to be exempted from floor area calculations, provided that the space is used for non-residential uses comply with standards requirements, such as minimum transparency, window requirements, and internal clearance. 
This will help encourage active users close to the sidewalk level to promote a safe and lively pedestrian environment while making sure that the resulted buildings are not out of scale. Next slide. In addition to that, the proposal would mandate a set of streetscape requirements to really improve the ground floor level of resilient buildings. So our regulations we classified into and split into two separate provisions, the ones that improve access and the ones that improve the ground floor level. Next slide. So now that I covered goal number two, I'll move forward with goal number three. The set of provisions located within this uh, category are what we call partial resiliency strategies. They will help building owners to undertake incremental steps towards resiliency without requiring the structure or sites to fully meet a pen XG. And I'll make a note that this is the sort of work that we've been mostly seeing in Manhattan and it's extremely important that we have regulations that help property owners take advantage of the incremental steps towards resiliency. Next slide. So we learned that raising mechanical equipment, often located below grade within cellars, is the first and most cost-effective step to make buildings more resilient. Proposal will continue to allow the relocation of equipment and enable more options for their placement above the flow level, either on top of roofs or in a separate structure, by considering MEP, mechanical equipment, as permitted obstruction. As shown in the picture, this is particularly relevant for housing campuses and a recommendation that came out from the outreach process, especially the East Side, Lower East Side, the East Village, Lower East Side, and Two Bridges Resilient Neighborhood Report. In coordination with NYCH and HPD was also crucial to advance this work. Next slide. A big portion of the floodplain also contains businesses that offer either neighborhood services or a part of the larger economy of the city. Many of these buildings cannot be completely elevated or dry flood proofed due to the cost or operation needs. But many of these building owners would like to raise priority spaces and equipment above harm's way so they can minimize business disruption in case of a storm event. So the proposal would also inc include a little bit of flexibility with use regulations to make sure that the spaces can be created above the flood level. Next slide. Proposal would also enable different types of flood protection measures to be implemented. This would include allowances for flood panels and landscape berms to be considered permitted obstruction in open areas. It would also allow spaces used for the storage of panels to be exempted from floor area to enable on-site storage, which is really crucial uh, for businesses and anyone to be prepared in advance of a coastal storm. Next slide. And lastly, when looking at our waterfront sites, zoning generally does not allow waterfront yards or required visual corridors to be raised to account for flood risk. In 2013, we already passed uh, regulations to add flexibility to waterfront development. Many sites at the water, water's edge are also required to provide public access, as you all know, using specific design standards and have really little flexibility to accommodate what we've been seeing as best resiliency practice. This proposal would offer more flexibility for the grading of the sites and would continue to facilitate resilience measures such as soft shorelines. Next slide. So now I'll speak about our final goal, which is differently from the previous ones in that these rules would really be applied not just to the floodplain, but on a city-wide level. Next slide. So Sandy showed us how a storm effects can go beyond the floodplain, especially regarding issues with our energy grid. Proposal will therefore allow power systems, including generators, solar energy systems, fuel cells, batteries, and other energy storage systems to be considered permitted obstructions in open areas across all zoning districts to really facilitate their install, installment and have property owners have a backup energy plan. Next slide. In addition to that, to ensure that all areas of the city can easily provide ADA access, proposal will classify both ramps and lifts as permitted obstruction in all required open areas to facilitate accessible designs. Next slide. Another important issue is how disasters, especially those that lead to physical damage, impact vulnerable populations. Hurricane Sandy and other storms across the nation have exposed how Difficult, the difficulties facing nursing home residents in areas at high risk of flooding. Nursing homes are licensed to house populations that require continual medical care. 
and research shows that this dependency can be strained whether nursing homes shelter in place or evacuate prior to a coastal storm. Therefore, the city believes it would be appropriate to limit the growth of nursing homes in high-risk areas to lessen the health consequences and logistical challenges of evacuating the residents of these facilities. Proposal would prohibit the development of new nursing homes within the 1% floodplain and other selected geographies likely to have limited vehicular access during a storm event. Existing facilities, though, would still be able to conduct enlargements for modest improvements, including those that help with resiliency. Next slide. So lastly, Sandy showed us that a lengthy process to update zoning regulations can slow disaster response. The proposal would make certain that recovery provisions are available to be enabled quickly after following this uh, future disaster. Some of these provisions will be implemented now to actually help address COVID-19 pandemic and its associated economic effects. And one example of that is for uh, any property owner that is carrying a city planning commission permit or an authorization to have another uh, term so they can come back to the city planning commission and complete their plans since this is really impacting our economy. Next slide. So this kind of covers the proposal. So in terms of next steps, the citywide text amendment, as I mentioned, has been referred out on October 19th to 1259 community boards, borough boards and borough presidents for 60 days. Then it will go to the city planning commission, city council for before adoption. More information of the, for the project, including an annotated version of the text, as Aska mentioned, can be found on our, our website. And this concludes the presentation about proposed changes and we can uh, take questions. Thank you so much for your attention. So um, is there anyone else that's going to speak on this on behalf of DCP or can we open it up to questions? We can open it up to questions, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, Tammy, you had your hand up. So for, for community board one, this is particularly important simply because I would estimate that based on the new map that you have and that you showed at the community board one meeting, we're talking 65%, if not more of community board one would be covered by this new plan. So I've got several questions. One, there is, correct me if I'm wrong, no changes to, uh, for historic districts. There's no carve out, there's nothing that every, everyone cross district zoning no matter what would get a minimum of a 10 foot height bonus as well as the far not including ground level or below streetscape that's the first question i have four yeah let's go one by one uh, of course um so yeah the proposal will be available to all lots in the one percent and 0.2 percent low plains um important things to note is the height, the floor area, all those regulations, they only are only offered if the building will conduct major renovations or if a new construction that's coming in is uh, you know, following all the building code standards for resiliency construction in Appendix G. So it's not that everything that's there gets 10 feet or anything like that. It's, it's really depending on the work that you're gonna conduct. And so, uh, yeah. With that, with this, Community Board One is being asked to opine in a ULERT process on what is arguably the largest and last most public valued asset in the city of Governor's Island. It is a city amenity. It is a city public park. And with the development zones and the projects that have been shown, this text amendment it runs on the same ULERT process as it does. And yet every single presentation that they have showed us will now need to be changed. Every height restriction, every shade, everything that you have shown because you have now marked the entire island as in the flood zone. 
So how can we be asked as Community Board 1 to properly opine on an application when everything about that application that we're being shown and many of the things that are highly controversial are directly affected by this zoning text amendment? And for that matter, all the ULERP processes that are in the as you say, oh, we need to help the developers right now because they're struggling in ULERP, I would suspect to say that the community boards are overwhelmed. So if you're gonna put this through at the same time as the others, it's actually patently unfair because you're asking community boards to opine on a ULERP process that is going to change the second this comes through. See, yeah, thank you so much for your comment and question. Um, with Governor's Island, uh, so one thing, very important thing to note is that all the regulations that include, are included in zoning for coastal flood resiliency, they're really optional. So it's not that it automatically changes the proposal in Governor's Island. It's just that if a building is being built in Governor's Island, they basically have two pathways. They could completely ignore the proposal uh, for the citywide tax for 6,400 regulations and just meet building code regulations. So if the building is being built in the portion that is in the floodplain in Governor's Island, it would really just follow the proposed uh, regulations that are being passed as part of that project in that action. Um, and the other, you know, another option that people have is, you know, building code and in FEMA already have their requirements. If they bump into an issue to really meet those regulations with zoning, the citywide proposed tax is just offering a relief valve so you don't have to, you know, bump into those uh, constraints. And it's really like everything is tied to resilience improvement. So nothing is given for free. And uh, it, I just wanted to really note that because it's, it's a I very would, particular... I Matt, I appreciate that comment, but I disagree with that simply because if I bought a beach house, I understand the risks of buying a beach house. I, I pay more money because I'm on the beach front. I, it's a value and a thing that I own, right, if I buy that. If I'm concerned about being on the beach front and the wear and tear on my building, I might not buy on the beach front. So I, I can under, I, I am not really certain on, on all of this because it really does seem to me that we want resiliency built, but at the cost of all the zoning and all the historic and every other thing that we've worked so hard, hard for in community board one, I find it very difficult. And I can't speak for other, other you know, community boards, I'm speaking for my own. And I find it very difficult. Governor's Island in its whole has a whole resiliency and climate change. So it's not as if it has nothing to do with or if they opt in it's being touted by the city and the governor's island that this is the leading cause for the so it will change everything that comes with it so i have many questions and concerns you know you say one level of basement what about for a developer that has two levels of basement do they get both levels not included in the far if it's been used for parking and storage so if they have an underground floor of an actual basement, is that the question? Yeah. Two, base, two basements underground. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they don't get to, you know, the flexibility that's necessary uh, to raise probably those two floors above the floor level. They, it's probably not going to work out uh, if the building is already maxed out on height and FAR. No, for new, then, for new development, based on what you've said, they get a basement level as long as it's used for storage or parking, correct? And then 10 feet from ground up. What if they have two levels for basement and storage? Okay, so if they have two levels of basement and storage underground, um, in they if they do the ground floor also basement like storage, mm -hmm. they they if they wet floor proof. So first, oh yeah, so that's <laughs> now I'm getting the the scenario here. So the wet floor proofing fire exemption is when you allow the water to flow in and out of the structure. So technically you cannot have anything below grade if you're doing a wet flow proofing ground floor. This is so, the dry, the dry. Uh, the dry, it's only if you are facing a commercial corridor and if you're dry flow proofing those two levels below grade plus the ground floor level, you don't get the full floor anymore. We're actually deleting that 
and we are just allowing the first 30 feet. If you're facing a commercial corridor, a primary street, you get only the first 30 feet if the ground floor is that grade level, has transparency, and has a good design and good clearance. So we are reducing the floor area exemption that now gives an entire floor for free. We're, we're removing that and we're cropping it to applicability only in commercial corridors. So it's not everywhere. And only the first 30 feet, if you, you comply with all those conditions. Plus the, plus the sub-level. The sub-level is 30. underlying zoning, yeah, so we're not changing anything regarding sub-levels. That's a, you know, something we have since, since zoning was first adopted in time, that we don't count floor area below grade in, in situations that's not used for living spaces. Yeah, that we're not just, we're not changing that. And is there a potential that the city would look and say, this text amendment takes priority, we will pass this first and then allow all other ULURPs to pause so they could adjust based on this? Because I have concerns that community boards review and look at all kinds of applications and every single one of the landmarks applications potentially, at least for community board one, the large ones we have, and for the ULURP actions that we're looking at will all change based on this text amendment. I see. Um, I can ask more of my colleagues from city planning about timelines, uh, but one thing to note that's very, very important for landmarks. Landmarks, they, uh, you know, the federal level uh, regulations for building code that are adopted here in Appendix G of building code, they actually already built in their system, all the way from federal to local, a relief valve for landmarks, because we understand that these regulations that come from the federal level about building codes, so the dry floor proofing, wet floor proofing, all of those things, elevation, it could conflict with landmarks. So that relief valve was already built in, so you actually can find a BSA special permit within building code in case a landmark triggers that uh, triggers the substantial improvement and all those requirements that they don't have to follow it because it could potentially lead to an impediment. So then the zoning code wouldn't even apply. This proposal it, wouldn't even apply. It applies to heights, correct? No, it wouldn't apply if the landmark doesn't fully comply appendix G of the building code, which is very, it's really unlikely that a, a landmark structure will be able to conduct all the renovations to make the building completely flood resilient and not have any impacts on the landmark. So the, the landmark uh, commission, they will still you know, revise those things before anything moves forward on the building code level and, and, and even zoning. So for a landmark property in a historic district, they would not be able to build 10 feet past the zoning that is approved for that area? Because that's not what your text amendment said or the presentation. I see. So if it, they only get the, the reference plane, the, the height relief, if the building fully complies with Appendix G. And I'm not aware of any building in the city that did that. And we already have all of that flexibility. But we, have, we have new construction in historic zones. That's why I'm asking. It is not okay. like it's impossible. There is, and that is a large part of what will happen on Governor's Island, as well as the South Street Seaport and other areas in my district. So that's okay. why I'm specifically asking about new construction, new construction zoning yes. heights. Yep. So yeah. yes, they do. They have the option of using this regulation. Which if then they comply breaks, with the code. Which breaks with the landmark and the zoning. Do they have to go to LPC, this new construction? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. So they, they would revise it and, you know, whatever they determine to be, you know, this is within our standards or not, like it would still be their call. Because we're not changing the process, we do offer this option. We do offer the relief, but we're not changing the process. So, so if it goes to LPC and they say, no, we need to change the design, then you need to change the design. So again, what that means is we're looking at, we have two major landmark applications in front of LPC on the same timeline track as this text amendment. If this text amendment passes, then both those landmark applications would have an availability to change beyond what landmarks has said and beyond what the community has said 
because we don't have a chance to opine, they will be able to build another 10 feet up as long as they comply with what you're talking about. They don't have to come back and get another approval if they change the design? Well, that's what I'm asking you because you're, if all they're doing is applying by the zoning text amendment. I, yeah, I, I just don't believe that they will get an approval from LPC and then be able to change the design and go directly to the Department of Buildings. Department of Buildings will probably see, you know, check if they are okay, if LPC is okay with the plan and if the plan Tammy, that was approved, right? Tammy, I'm, I'm aware of, of the Governor's Island application within your board. What, what is the other, can you just note for me what the other application is and we can get you a little more information on that? 17369 John. Thank you. And 250 Water. Thanks very much. We can get, we can get you more information on that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Going once. I have a question, Rosie. Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. I've, I've also raised my hand. Cost associated with what will be required across the city and how this will be implemented short or long term. Um, any economic outlook on what this does, both upfront cost and then long-term gain? Thank you for your question. Um, so this is not gonna be requiring any work um, at all. So it's really, we're just removing zoning hindrances for anyone that's already you know, thinking about doing a resilience improvement in their structure are actually, you know, it's one of the things that we heard a lot is sometimes, uh, you know, a, a property owner is actually replacing their boiler. And if they're in the flow plane, what we're trying to do is provide the flexibility that's necessary so that property owner can actually change their decision. Instead of replacing a boiler in kind, usually in, in a seller space that is not flow proofed, that they, you know, consider the option of putting that boiler, boiler elsewhere above the expected flow elevation. So then one, once there is a new flood event, they don't get uh, you know, their systems impacted. So we, because we aren't uh, mandating anything, um, we don't really, you know, are, we're not posing any economic challenges. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, if I could ask a question or two. Um, in the entirety of, with the exception of one building, one residential building, the entirety of my district um, waterfront is a public mapped park. Um, so does this apply to structures from the parks department, I guess is one question. And the other question is, um, the, if there were full compliance as you had uh, posited it, um, and the opportunity to take advantage of the additional height, can that be monetized or commoditized such that um, uh, it could be transferred from one building to another or from one structure to another? So on the parks question, I probably need to get back to you on that. Um, I'm thinking if, you know, we're, we're not, we're blind to, you know, if it's a, a governmental building or a, pro a private property owner, but I'm not sure because of the zoning map or district that where, where it's located, the park, I'll just need to check that to see if zoning applies in general. Uh, if zoning applies to the properties, then this text will offer relief to, to those properties as well. So that's the first. And the question, yeah, and the second question was having to do with whether this could be transferred in some way that, that uh, it could be um, used by somebody other than the building that actually did the, uh, made the changes. Uh, thank you for the question. No, no, you, you, the, all the provisions, they really apply to the property. So it's the zoning lot. So for each zoning lot, you have access to these rules. If you make the building fully comply with Appendix G, if not exceed those requirements. Uh, so it's just really for the property in question. Thanks. Thank Rosie, you. Alita Camp, Trevor Holland, um, and Xavier Santiago. Hi. Okay. So 
I um, would like to see a specific codification of what you just explained about landmarks, because we all know that loopholes are embraced by people. And if it's not codified, even though it makes complete sense, what you're saying that um, it might be exploited. So it, there should be something specific in there. And also, I'm not really understanding, and I'm sorry, I know that we've had multiple um, presentations by DCP about why I understand wet wet flood proofing because the water is rushing through but for dry flood proofing why do they get that much more height for making something that's not a residence not a business that's storage or parking or something why that would give them more height and just finally I know there's a reference and you mentioned something about how this is this will work with um, COVID-19, but I'm not really sure how this applies or what the benefits might be. We're, we're very sensitive to additional um, height. Thank you. Thank very you so much. much for great questions. Um, so yeah, the first, I guess the first one about the wet and dry flow proofing. Um, so the wet flow proofing, when you allow the water to flow through the structure, is the one that you wouldn't have any subgrade spaces. So you just have the ground floor and the water flows in and out. That one from uh, FEMA and building code, it, the use it's restricted for, to parking storage and access. So then because the use is so uh, tight, you know, you can only use those, do those three things, then it doesn't make sense to, to count that towards floor area because all the units, all the accessible or other uses for, for that building, it's usually a, a residential strategy. They will be in the second story and up. So then we need to make sure that all units can be placed above the flow level. Uh, and really, you know, that ground floor, it's much easier when we heard that from architects, it's much easier to design that base entirely wet flow proofed with the axes, the elevator, you know, protected and everything like that. The dry flow proofing is uh, different because only non-residential uses can actually dry flow proof. And dry flow proofing is the only method that you can keep active uses close to the sidewalk level. And New York City is such a city that depends upon that connection, right, of the sidewalk and the building. So that's why, uh, you know, in the, since 1989 and then uh, the 12, 2013 flow text, they were entirely exempted spaces that are dry flow proof because we wanted that activity close to the to, to ground. But that is the thing that actually increases building size because it's actual active uses, right? So if you are exempting that, then you are potentially giving another floor. So then what we did after we heard that concern, especially with the Manhattan conversations, we decided to crop that amount just to a, a like really a small portion of the, the storefront to be exempted. So then people still build close to sidewalk level, but they don't get the entire floor exempted. So that's but, something we took upon. But that's what I guess what I don't understand, and I'm sorry for staying on this. I know there are other questions, which is they're still using the space and it, it benefits everybody. It benefits the pedestrians, it benefits the community, and it benefits the store or the commercial property business. So why do they get any additional height or any bonus? Because what they're doing is, is they're still using everything. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Just, I just, I know, yeah. I understand the wet. I'm just confused about the dry and appreciate the dry. your patience. Yeah. No, and, yeah, and it's a great question. Thank it's you. a great question. Yeah. So, so basically if we don't do anything, let's say we remove completely this exemption. What that means, and we've seen that happen in areas that don't have access to that, is that people just raise the, the commercial uh, ground floor. And for example, with our West Chelsea report that we did with the resilient neighborhood studies, that was something that we heard a lot. We don't want our ground floors, our retail, to start being disconnected from the sidewalk level. So that's just a, a minor incentive. You know, the first 30 feet, it's a minor incentive that is, you know, doesn't give a whole FAR. It's a minor incentive to try to pull that use down, to try to really keep that at least the, the first portion of the retail frontage close, closer to the sidewalk level. Uh, 
especially especially in Manhattan, I, I you know really fear of uh, developers just starting raising that for that first lab moving forward. Okay, I could email more about this because I think that there might be other kinds of um, incentives that would work um, other than bonuses, but I don't need to take up more time with this. And again, if you could, uh, sorry, just think about codifying the landmarks issue and, and just briefly, please. And again, I know there are other questions about the applicability of this to COVID-19. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, so COVID-19, uh, it's something, so we were already developing the part of the proposal to facilitate with future disaster recovery. And all the rules that we are including now uh, as part of the action that we're proposing to include, they are to assist damage uh, that comes from storms, or other types of disaster that lead to physical damage. When COVID started, and we realized that there are other types of disasters that don't lead to physical damage, but impact the city in other ways. We, you know, we've been passing, the mayor has been doing a lot of emergency orders to provide the necessary relief for us to go through this. And we, through that process, oh, we went through the emergency order. We identify only two items that seem to be helpful for us to allow now uh, as part of the action, because once that we are out of the emergency, the, the mayor emergency orders, they, they, it's gone, right? They cannot go past that. So then those two items that we identified, they will give short and medium term relief. So it's not also a permanent text, text amendment, it's just giving two extra years. So the first one, two extra years for non-conforming uses to come back to business. So we have sometimes businesses in residential districts that people just I couldn't open their doors that. yet. They're still trying right. to figure that out, you know, the financially. And right now, if they don't come back in two years, they lose their grandfathering. So we're just giving extra two years, so a total of four for this business, especially a small business, to come back. And the other one is in case there is a, a property owner that came to the City Planning Commission for a special permit or an authorization, usually those, they cannot go beyond 10 years so we have in our underlying zoning rules that you can do a, a three-year, a four-year, and then three-year renewal, three-year renewal, and then it's over. So because of the economic challenge that we have now in, in the next few years, we're just allowing them to come back to City Planning Commission for another term of three years. So instead of you know, 10, 10 years and you're done, in case there are people already in the end of that process and they just wanna complete the plans, they will come back to City Planning Commission, just be able to get another three years to start construction. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor? Hi, just some quick comments. Uh, our land use committee also struggled uh, with this, uh, uh, what you have presented. And thank you for making this presentation a little more focused on Manhattan. I think the presentation that we've seen uh, sort of focused on the outer boroughs was really made it difficult, even more difficult to digest. So if we could make sure that in any future presentation just looks at Manhattan, it's helpful. That being said, the, we had concerns about incentivizing uh, development along the waterfront and adding height in, increases and whether we should be building along the waterfront in the first place and not looking at a possible retreat. Uh, the what was not really explained at the committee is how this would help small businesses and smaller landlords. Uh, I don't think that we, we sort of got into that discussion. And the just clarification: Will this increase increase far for development? And the urgency of us looking at this right now, because as Tammy mentioned, we're facing a lot of issues. So if you can explain if it increases far and the urgency. And the last point is what you mentioned about uh, dry uh, flood proofing. We've seen a few buildings that have these large podiums, uh, sometimes four story high that are just blank walls, uh, sort of look like, to be honest, prisons because they just have these blank walls. Will this, the dry flood proofing, sort of eliminate that so we get some sort of streetscape as opposed to these uh, four story podiums? Thank you for the questions. Um, so maybe I'll start with the last one. And yes, the, the whole point of the small floor area exemption for dry flow proofing spaces 
is to start having less of that podium design and less of that elevated ground floor design and more of the design that we're all used to. The design that you have, you know, the entrance at the sidewalk level and they use at the sidewalk level. So that's definitely the intent. Um, and, and then the other, so, but, uh, but just a parenthesis, we are not really, you know, this, pr this proposal is not mandating anything. So any building that's already there, if they're not taking any um, renovation, not doing a substantial improvement, they just may not proceed with using this at all, right? Because this is only given if you are at grade, if you're drive flow proof, if you comply with transparency, the streetscape requirements, everything that we're building in the system with the proposal. Um, so the other question that you had, uh, I'm blanking now. Um, fair increase. The fair increase. So FAR increase, we are not changing FAR per se. We're not saying, you know, districts like this actually have now higher FARs. We're not doing that. It's just that the, what we are doing, we're allowing that floor area to be exempted in key situations to incentivize the things that we think are crucial for the city to be able to move forward with a long-term strategy at the building scale. So the ones that I mentioned that are more prevalent is really the wet flow proofing floor area exemption. And that's again, just because the floor cannot be used for anything other than parking storage and access is federal level uh, requirement. And so it's not useful. The other one is for uh, dry flow proofing because, and, and again, this is exactly what we're trying to avoid. We heard so much from communities that they don't want those podiums. They don't want those elevated ground floors. They don't want to have to climb stairs and ramps to get access to buildings, especially in our commercial corridors that really rely on being a grade for that activity, for that you know, good, um, good experience that we have in the city. And so the dry flow proofing already exists since the 80s. We are actually reducing it just to the, the minimal necessary that we need to encourage the good long-term resilient design that we all want. So that's, Hopefully that answers the question um, yeah, for that. Thank you. And the urgency. The urgency. Issue. So the urgency issue, um, I'm not sure. You're saying like why we're now at the public review process, right? Is that more or less the question? Correct. You mentioned earlier in the presentation about a few things that were going to expire. So expire. I'm curious as to. Thank you. So we've been working on this for a very long time and we were uh, targeting the referral for this text right before the pandemic started. So we were actually, uh, we had a referral targeted for February. Um, so we've been doing a lot of uh, work because of the environmental review process. We had to analyze, you know, it's a citywide text, it's very complicated. So we have been working on that so, so extensively for several years, especially years of 2018 and 19 on that process uh, and that, you know, that part of the process. And we were about to refer out and then we had the pandemic. And, and so one of the things that we're really trying to do here is to have these regulations ready for the next hurricane season. We shouldn't go to another hurricane season without having this flexibility and this minor tweaks that we're doing. Most of the, the things we have are really, you know, they're ready. And, but these minor tweaks can actually help us make a better decision moving forward. So if we are, if we have buildings being damaged in the next hurricane season, we should have access to these regulations because then people can actually incorporate sea level rise projections when you're, you know, jacking up structures in, in neighborhoods. People should be able to do that in a way that's smarter, that's more, you know, not just short looking, but long term looking. So that's, that's the urgency that we're really building into. And the, te the temporary text, one of them expired this year. So the 2015 recovery text expired in July. We worked very closely with the mayor's office to add relief into the emergency order, just so people that are still using that really helpful recovery text still have access to those regulations to make buildings more, more resilient. And the other text is gonna expire when FEMA adopts the new flood insurance rate maps which you know, their timeline right now is uh, looking at 2024. So while we think, oh, maybe we have a couple of years, we've been working on this for a long time. And again, we shouldn't go into another hurricane season without having these minor tweaks to the text that could really, really help 
uh, advanced reco recovery process in the future. Thank you. And the last question I'm going to just ask you to follow up on because I know there's one more qu question. And that is, uh, we need to see a little more focus on how this would help small businesses and smaller landlords. But if you could, uh, we could talk about that offline, uh, because I think that was not presented well at our committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can follow up on that. But yeah, we have some provisions that are very helpful for uh, small property owners, business owners. We can follow up. Okay, Xavier. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I know there's a lot of work that goes into this um, planning. Um, obviously, Hurricane Sandy decimated our neighborhood as well, and we were having repairs carry on uh, throughout last year as well. How will this affect NYCHA uh, with these uh, textual changes? That's the first question. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so uh, we worked very closely with NYCHA and HPD, especially on their designs that they were advancing after Sandy. Um, most of their portfolio, as you're probably well familiar with, they are trying to ensure that mechanical systems are protected. It's, uh, it can be very difficult to you know, make all the buildings watertight or raise such large structures. So the, the most crucial step is to make sure that the building systems are uh, retrofitted, are elevated. So what the proposal, the proposal, as I said a couple of times, it applies to properties across the city's 1%, 0.2%. So with NYCHA, we know that they could potentially get mayor overrides if they have a zoning barrier, but that ends up delaying their process. So our provisions that, especially the ones that are adding flexibility for mechanical equipment and power systems, to be permitted obstruction on open areas. Those are the things that they, it's mostly gonna help them um, make those systems more, um, more resilient. One follow up, uh, thank you for answering that. And uh, again, we'll take this back um, to our land use and housing committee, but I think we share the same questions when it comes to small landlords, uh, small building owners too, and how this will, uh, intersect with discussions uh, of FAR and also to how the DCB was looking at um, taking an approach very similar to what they do abroad in London where they, the above grade versus below grade and how that's, whether there is habitable space that can be grandfathered in or brought in because as we know, obviously if you, you have this much light, it's just a tiny bit then you're definitely in a basement but versus if you're say, for example, in certain areas which have a higher elevation, and as you know, our flood zone in East Harlem, there are areas that uh, are completely safe and then others that are at high risk. And um, many of the smaller landlords and homeowners who have, say, a carve out apartment on the ground floor, but they have to take steps down and there are concerns there as well, um, as in addition to our storefront activity. So can you speak on that a little bit more? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so units below the expected flow elevation height is definitely the major concern here. Um, if, uh, you know, maybe the property owner could start with by uh, deploying flow panels, right? In advance of a storm, uh, all residents must evacuate. This is a mandated uh, step when we are facing a hurricane, we're about to face a hurricane. So residents would evacuate. Our emergency management office works very closely with property owners to make those plans work. So let's imagine that. So residents evacuate. Property owner could take advantage of zoning for coastal flood resiliency text to easily deploy flow panels in advance of a storm in front of the property. That's more of the kind of easier uh, incremental resiliency strategies or step that people are have been undertaking. For the but the best best outcome really would be if those units could be relocated right because people that are located below the flow elevation they're facing risk every hurricane season of being inundated and not being able to return to their homes for several months as we see we saw after sandy so what the proposal uh, is doing to facilitate that is the height allowance that we're adding is really because we have a lot of spaces that may need to be relocated. And with large structures, uh, as I was showing in the beginning of the presentation, those buildings, they can't be physically jacked up. So they have to evacuate those stories and build on top of the structure or elsewhere in the lot. Um, so the proposal is giving that bulk flexibility. So especially those retrofit strategies could be advanced. 
All right, thank you. If you could have the presentation emailed to us as well, we may invite you to come and present. Sounds good, thank you. Um, I, I have another question, if I may. Um, someone in the question and answer asked a question that makes sense because we're looking um, for height limits on some of our avenues. And people have, have spoken at the public session at full board meetings about the implications for the environment of building taller than 210 feet. And wouldn't it make sense to seriously consider changing some of the heights and dealing with the climate change issue in the city? Um, I know that this has obviously an immediate concern um, with respect to potential flooding, given what happened with Storm Sandy years ago. But in terms of the future, doesn't it make sense to evaluate what these heights, what the glass, what all of the changes in infrastructure, the additional congestion and density are, how they're contributing to the environmental changes that are leading to elevated sea levels? Thank you. I know that that's beyond the scope here, but, um, but because someone raised it and because it's an issue for CB8 in terms of height limits and because there seems to be significant um, research demonstrating the impact of some of this types of, con or construction really on, on environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it's it's very important for us to you know keep doing uh, that policy, having that policy discussion and doing analysis. In, the, in a citywide text, it's very hard for us to make those land use decisions uh, because we are really, you know, the first thing we need to do is just remove barriers out of the way. So each property on an actively lens uh, really can uh, advance resiliency, either incrementally or doing the full, the full uh, set of work that is needed to make the building resilient now and in the future. So hopefully, you know, people make that decision of also looking at future projections. No, I understand that, and I don't, and and I realize that it's it's beyond obviously what your presentation is, but the the, in, the environment should be looked at in a broad sense, not just the the immediate fix of dealing with coastal resiliency, but also the impact. So I'm just throwing that there as a topic for discussion at DCP and other relevant agencies. We, Thank we you. We would welcome that. We would welcome that in your in your recommendation and to share with both you know, other agencies that work on resiliency and sustainability um, because we are just one piece of, of that response. And so we'd, we'd like to be able to share that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. We'll include it. Thank you. So I, I see that Tammy has her hand raised, but we really, I know DCP has to leave and we still have a lot on the agenda. What I'm going to ask is if there are any remaining questions, um, if they can, if people can send them to me and I will get it to who at DCP. Danielle, Danielle, I'll get it to you, and then we'll get you the answers. Um, if not before the next meeting, then at, at the next borough board prior to the vote, um, DCP will make a brief presentation answering any of those outstanding questions you may have. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, Tammy, um, but we'll and and you did get to ask a bunch of questions in the beginning, so we'll. Uh, we're going to move on now to chair reports. Thank you, DCP, and we'll see you again next month. Uh, chair reports, um, Elias Arbueno, CB12. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosie, for being so kind and to allow me to go first. I know that it was the uh, CB11's uh, turn, but uh, we have uh, a media press conference in a few uh, hours which I invited your office to come in reference to a uh, resolution on um, how to uh, urge uh, small, not is urge businesses to prioritize the lines for the seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, we are looking to have uh, your office uh, and Gail to, uh, if they call, they call that her, and her schedule allows her to come, uh, to please come and participate uh, with this uh, wonderful event. The idea came from our aging committee chair, Mary Anderson, who is also a senior citizen and uh, came from a first-hand first experience, uh, is what motivated her to come with this great idea. Uh, in addition to that, uh, our board passed uh, two other important resolutions. One was the co-naming of 168th Street uh, between Broadway and Fort Washington, um, Healthcare Heroes Way. 
Uh, this is also an idea from our fellow and colleague, uh, board member, da Daryl Cochrane, uh, who uh, felt that uh, they needed to be appreciated. And this is just an important way of doing so. Uh, and last but not least, we are also um, asking city council to call name uh, um, the corner of the northeast northwest corner of Dykeman and Nago Avenue. I say uh, Moronta. I say Moronta is the uh, one of the the two um, kids uh, that drowned in in, um, in the Hudson River. Uh, Isaiah is the kid who uh, saw his um, friend um, while he was drowning and jumped in trying to save him. So we try to recognize uh, uh, just that uh, humanity and what propelled him to um, save his friend's life. And um, that's uh, the two most important things that our board is uh, working on. Uh, there are a few other things, but uh, which such a packed presentation that we just had. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that. So thank you, Rosie, for, uh, for the time. Thank you, Eliezer. Um, CB11, uh, Xavier or Nilsa, I don't know who is going to give the report. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, first of all, I want to um, thank Eliezer. Um, he organized um, a call with CB9, 10, and 11 around the um, elections because we were concerned that depending on how the voting went, how it could um, impact our communities. And so the four chairs talked, to get, talked about um, what we've seen and how our properties could be affected. And I just wanted to first take a moment and thank him um, for taking the lead on that. Um, so community board is always quite busy, just like everyone's boards are this month. Um, we'll be looking at three um, ULERP applications, the Harlem, East Harlem Urban Renewal. We're also looking at um, a charter school application. We have also um, have had the open streets. It was quite successful. I want to thank the Manhattan Borough President for, the ha for coming for Halloween and, and participating, Isabel within um, the events that we had here. Um, a lot of new construction is happening in our district, so we're keeping an eye out for that. Of course, we continue to have um, the issues that um, have permeated our district in terms of the homeless situation and things like that. And this month we've been in conversation with the new owners of the Apple Bank site who are looking to redevelop and was asking for thoughts on what could go on that property. And in addition, the National Black Theater has had um, a project um, in the pipeline and they're starting to finalize it with a new construction crew. So they are, although they are not quite um, ready to start, they have started moving out of the National Black Theater District in preparation or when that should occur. I just want to give my um, vice chair a second or minute if he has anything he would like to add to this report. Thank you so much all. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Rosie and everyone. I know we have a lot on our plates. Uh, yeah, so we've, one of the other things we're highlighting, uh, we did have uh, the, uh, the mayor come through and to assess the area at 125th Street. We are still trying to get Oasis, uh, which is obviously a state agency to come to the table. Uh, to uh, have a bit of more clarity given to us to why so many uh, centers are being located in our district uh, throughout Central Harlem, East Harlem, uh, and concentrated when the vast majority of the clients are not based within the community. Um, we're also examining 125th Street and ways to continue improving that uh, as we go through, again, as Nelson said, the urban renewal plan, and I think keeping our eyes on the wall. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, Gail, it was great seeing you. Isabel, Rosie, everyone who came out uh, for the open streets. We served, I think it was just on 101st alone, uh, 700 uh, um, uh, kids and adults, uh, but majority of kids when we had the Halloween safe distance trick-or-treating. Uh, it was really great there, as well as uh, the Day of the Dead, unfortunately, got rained out. 
uh, with their activities. But overall, we came close to the 3,000 um, people served for that event uh, safely. And uh, I, I want to applaud everyone on that, especially Uptown Grand Central and Carol was just fantastic. Uh, we are looking, and I did mention this briefly to you, Gail, that if we do wind up uh, having uh, hopefully a, a wintry mix of snow uh, to activating that space on 119th uh, and Pleasant because that's a suitable space that where we could create uh, outside resources for just, you know, kids to get out and play safely in the snow. Uh, so we're reaching out to the Department of Sanitation and other uh, agencies to see if that's something that can be achieved on a last minute pivot uh, for, for the district. So that's all for my reports. I'll drop my information in the chat and I thank you all as partners in making Manhattan the best borough in the city. So. Thank you. CB1. Tammy? Good morning. Good morning. Sorry about that. Taking, taking notes from everybody. So thank you so much. Um, CB1 is unusually busy. I'd love to say that we were having a gracious fall, but our fall has been incredibly overwhelmed. We have Governor's Island, which I I, I was grateful that the borough president has sent the request out to all the land use for all the chairs, um, land use committees for all the CBs. Please understand our perspective, even though we are the ones who opine on it because it is in our community board, we are actively searching for all community boards to take a look at the governor's island presentation and send us opinions because this is a public asset and amenity of New York City, period, and stop end statement there. It is super important that um, we have testimony or feedback from other community boards. I know that there may be a resistance to doing that, but even if you send us, we've had a discussion, here's what our board feels, here's what our community feels as public testimony written, sent to us, um, we would highly appreciate it. Um, we've also reached out to the Brooklyn CBs as well to the two that are relevant who have had presentations from, all are relevant, but the two who have had presentations from Governor's Island, um, which makes our concern about the new text amendment because we've spent hours and months and years looking at this and all of it is relevant for both that in uh, last month after borough board we passed a resolution about air rights we have a mechanism in our historic seaport district of air rights transference and there is uh, questions we are looking at proposals in front of landmarks now again that'll have to change due to the text amendment most likely but has to do with transference of air rights and where they go and where they don't um, it is very Time consuming, the last meeting we had was five hours and it's one of two. Um, we had a discussion about licensing. We have an uptick with open streets and the use of outdoor rooftops and outdoor terraces. Um, so we're having an uptick in noise complaints above and beyond what we've had before. So licensing has done a resolution asking SLA to review that, but we have concerns because again, as we've spoken before at this borough board, with open streets, noise complaints are also, well, when the curfew is not there, noise complaints continue with bars and restaurants open after midnight in front of residential buildings. Um, uh, and Youth and Ed had passed a resolution this month asking the Department of Education to move, to allow high school and middle school admissions and applications to run as close as has been in the past and not to make substantial change because after all at this point how much change can you possibly make without robust public engagement which seems to be the, the rigor as happening um so that's a lot of what's happening we are waiting to hear i believe will be if not today but monday the ruling on 52 william street and uh the men from the lucerne with whatever is happening on there. And we are, we had an interesting presentation from City Bike who told us that the continual outreach to install new bikes is based on a contract that they had with the city and a requirement to install a certain number of bikes within a certain time frame, And that the pandemic, even though you can't buy a bicycle anywhere 
in New York, really, because they're all sold out. Um, they're not looking at any of numbers that have happened post-COVID or during COVID, that all of their saturation and sightings are based on, one, the contract that they have and guaranteed to install city bikes, and two, saturation levels pre-COVID. I have concerns about that, um, and we have already passed a resolution asking that some of the contracting goes back into the controller's hands for look, and I sincerely wonder whether maybe there was a cost savings thing I'm not looking to hit city by card, but I'm looking to understand how we can be consistently expanding something. At the moment, we want to help transportation, but shouldn't we be taking a pause to take a look at that and not fulfilling a contract because we have to versus looking at cost savings and usage and saturation across the city? So um, that is my, my thing. We are looking forward Thank you for uh, the change in the tolling. We are hoping actually for lower Manhattan and traffic that makes a definite positive impact for those of us um, attached to the bridges and the tunnels. And I think that's where I'll leave it because I spent so much time on the zoning text amendment to start with. Thank you, Tammy. Carter, CB2. Morning, everybody. Uh, so following up on last month, um, the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan, uh, last month I had reported we were a bit surprised when the city announced that they were undertaking a, um, uh, that process and that they had uh, released or were going to be releasing a draft scope at that point. Uh, they've released it now and um, we've got a couple of key dates coming up with that. Uh, there's December 3rd, the Department of City Planning is uh, having a public scoping hearing via Zoom on December 8th. Our community board is having a public hearing on our response to the draft scope. And then uh, we're having a business session on December 9th. Um, what I'm hearing from, from our members is that uh, we're not necessarily against the stated goals of the city, but we're against the process and the manner in which the city uh, went about proposing uh, the proposal and um, also the uh, the um, manner in which they want to meet those goals. I mean, it's really difficult when, when there's no discussion and, uh, and uh, a disconnect between the public engagement process and what we, we, what we see in the end. Um, echoing Tammy, we're also very happy with that the two-way tolling is about to go into effect in the Verrazano Bridge on December 1st. That uh, should make a big impact in our community on, on Canal Street and, uh, and certainly in a lot of other people's um, communities with respect to the tunnels. Uh, also wanted to highlight uh, a great meeting that we had this month and a couple of resolutions from our equity working group. Um, Patricia Larry and Mar Fitzgerald who are, who, who are watching this, uh, this are our regular watchers of Borough Board. Um, we hosted Cecily Harris from Community Board 10 and uh, Karen Horry who's the chair of their Parks and Recreation Committee and they presented CB10's resolution to support the exhibit in Central Park to commemorate the exonerated five in social justice. Uh, we're gonna be voting on a resolution in support tonight at our full board meeting. Um, we also hosted a great presentation from Kama Uware, who's the founder of the Black Gotham Experience on unearthing the African presence in CB2. And we really had a pretty fascinating uh, presentation, um, identified uh, 28 different parcels totaling over 138 acres that were owned by free black men and women in the 1640s, which I think is something that's really surprising to a lot of people in our board because it's history that's just uh, not talked about. And so we, we've got a couple of, um, uh, or we have a resolution that supports some ideas on how we can bin, begin commemorating um, that history, both uh, you know on a temporary basis initially and on a permanent ongoing basis, but it was really fascinating. And um, I'm really glad that we're taking the steps on uh, moving moving forward in um, with our equity working group. Uh, and it wouldn't, my report wouldn't be complete without talking about outdoor dining um, and the ongoing issues that we're seeing with that. We were one of the big supporters of uh, a lot of different ways um, that outdoor dining could be implemented. Again, sort of the echoing refrain is nobody listened. Um, we're seeing right now tremendous issues. I mean, it's actually 
frankly, quite shocking on the disconnect between what the city and DOT have been um, uh, allowing or not intervening in on for our local businesses who, who built some structures that many of them uh, feel are legal, but was made very clear yesterday by Department of Transportation that they're not legal at all. Um, there are no enclosed structures or no structures of any type of any sort are allowed on the sidewalk. Uh, and in the last month, we saw businesses spending thousands of dollars on those structures and nobody took the time to tell any of these businesses that are struggling that they're not allowed. And it's just shocking, you know, and, and I think that it, for many of these businesses, the amount of money that they've spent on, on outdoor dining, which is supposed to be a lifeline that's pretty much erases, you know, a significant amount of that benefit of what they've spent and having to unravel those structures. I'm gonna put in the link when I, in the chat when I'm done, just the link to the Office of Nightlife's town hall where they really went through a lot of those um, issues. And, and the reason I keep mentioning this is uh, Valerie De La Rosa, the chair of our reopening working group, uh, we've got a great resolution discussing this tonight, which I'm happy to share if there's anybody's interested, but we have CB2 is the highest number of open restaurant permits of all community districts. We have 911 open restaurant permits and the highest number of open street restaurant sites. We have 16 open streets. Um, which is 20%, 28% of all the open streets in Manhattan. Um, so this is a big issue for us. And then the other issue just is propane heaters and also confusion that came out with that. And so it, it's, we would hope going forward that this process uh, can be improved dramatically. Um, and I think that for, for our community board, we're going to be putting forth that our position is that um, that we can only advance the permanent outdoor dining program uh, if there's an evaluation of the existing temporary outdoor program with the residents and operators, that there's a plan for a formalized community review process, and that there's an enforcement plan. And so that's something that's uh, that that. Um, we're voting on tonight, but we're also obviously going to be working on this uh, over the coming months. Um, if anybody's interested in talking about that further, they can reach out to me directly. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Rosie, you're on that that thing called that starts with an M that we don't like to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take one minute right now. Um, we are running late and our next presenter, Afraz Khan, has offered to do his presentation on another day. So he will be coming back in January. So I wanna thank Afraz uh, for being so understanding and patient. And he's been waiting for a few months to present and now he's gonna wait till the new year. Um, being that 2020 wasn't a good year, maybe this, this will work out for the best. Thank you so much, Afraz. Um, uh, thank you, Carter. And now we move on to CB3. Trevor. Hi, thank you. This is actually my first uh, borough board meeting and I'm subbing uh, last minute, so I really don't have a long report. I think that should be good for the rest of the uh, reports. It's, it's going to be brief. Uh, we continue to be challenged uh, by uh, all of the projects that are going on along our coastline. It's a blessing to have the investment for coastal resiliency in our neighborhood, but it's also uh, wind up having really long meetings. <clears throat> Currently, we have the Eastside Coastal Resiliency, Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency, Brooklyn Bridge, Montgomery Coastal Resiliency, Pier 42, Pier 36, Pier 35, the East River Esplanade Project, the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, Beach Esplanade Project, the Lower East Side Ecology Center, and its accompanying top compost shard. Uh, those projects dominate most of what we're uh, handling in the uh, CB3. Uh, but hopefully uh, the next uh, borough board, our chair or uh, vice chair will provide a longer update on what is going on in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor. Uh, Jeffrey, CB4. Hi, everybody. Thank you. A um, couple of updates today. Uh, Pier 76 in Hudson River Park uh, continues to get tremendous attention. Um, there is interest in moving the NYPD tow pound 
off of the pier so we can turn that into um, a public park and um, uh, likely some type of, type of development site as well. Um, this past month at our Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee, um, committee meeting of which I'm a co-chair, uh, we had uh, not just one but two state commissioners in attendance. Um, Department of Environmental Conservation and uh, State Parks was there as well as a number of folks from the governor's office. The governor has taken a keen interest on turning Pier 76 into open space, which is 25 years um, overdue. But there are a number of complications as it relates to moving the tow pound. Community Board 4 is, is very understanding and recognizing the need um, of the tow pound and that it should stay in Community District 4. And so we're working to figure out where that can go. Um, and in the meantime, thinking through what interim uses um, we'd like to see on the pier um, once that pier shed comes down. So it's, there's momentum that we're excited about, but we're also um, cognizant of the fact that um, you know, this, is, this is not an overnight change, but um, that 25 years uh, of, of talking about this and we're actually having meetings about it now um, is great. Changing gears, um, sh um, hotel shelter issue on 36th Street continues to be um, a major concern in the community. I'm, I'm sure Lowell has shared, we have um, 800 shelter uh, residents that were located to one block um, on 36th Street and we've asked for at least one of those hotels to be relocated within Community District 4. Um, Gail's been extremely helpful in that regard and we continue to um, focus our efforts there. And then finally, I just wanted to share um, in my paycheck job, I'm the executive director of the meatpacking bid and Small Business Services organizes a weekly um, call with various city agencies. And this past week, we had an excellent presentation from the um, Health and Hospitals Corporation's executive director for the Track and Trace program. Um, for COVID. And as a part of that, we've now asked the Track and Trace program to come present at our, um, our next full board meeting in December. Um, it was an illuminating and extremely informative program. Um, my takeaway was that uh, they have the capacity to do testing, but they don't have the bandwidth. And so they're looking for more partners to do pop-up testing sites um, across the communities. They were looking for bids or businesses to do it, but I just think it would be a great way for folks to become more aware of the city's capacity, also better understanding of the track and trace program. Um, and I, I think that given the numbers, the changes we've seen happen in the past week, um, it, it might serve all of our constituents well to hear from that particular entity as it relates to the pandemic right now. Um, I'll leave it at that. And also introduce Scarlett. This is her uh, first borough board meeting, so she's happy to be here as well. Have a good day, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Craig, CB5. Thanks, Rosie, and nice to meet you, Scarlett. Um, just a few things in District 5 uh, this month. Uh, I think many of you know that our new district manager, Marisa Mock, started uh, last month. She's doing a wonderful job. We're, we're thrilled to have her. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful addition. Um, the first uh, item I wanted to talk about uh, from a resolution perspective was a resolution that we have which dealt with the design and the reconstruction of the Park Avenue malls. Uh, these malls were built uh, about 100, over 100 years ago or in the early 20th century. They're under DOT jurisdiction, but they're primarily actually managed by a combination of bids, not-for-profits, uh, and building owners. Uh, the train shed uh, that's partially underneath these malls is in a terrible state of disrepair and needs to be repaired, which basically will result in the temporary removal of, of the malls between 46th and 57th streets. So we passed a resolution that called upon the relevant agencies, the mayor's office, DOT, MTA, and the like, to really use this opportunity to bring in urban design and landscape experts to rethink the design of these malls to really create a wonderful, unique, uh, new open space. This opportunity doesn't come often. As I said, it was over 100 years ago uh, that, was, that it was built. So we really want the city to take this opportunity and use it wisely. When we had the whole East Midtown rezoning a few years ago, along with many stakeholders, we advocated for funds uh, generated by new developments uh, and administered by that governing group to, to be allocated to these malls. So uh, we hope that there is going to be progress there. The second item that I wanted to bring up is the, our annual statement of district needs. And I'm obviously not gonna go through it all, we don't have the time, uh, but I did wanna highlight a few things from our statement. First, we, had, we identified as the top three uh, issues as homeland, homelessness, quality of life issues, and uh, economic development and recovery, which is important now, primarily with, uh, particularly with COVID. 
we're advocating for a holistic approach to homelessness that addresses the concerns for safety, possessions, pets, significant others, recreation, social space, and comprehensive program for both mental health and substance abuse. One of our top, top capital requests is to increase the budget for the HPD's Our Space Initiative, which funds new construction uh, rental units for the formerly homeless. On quality of life, we're obviously not looking to criminalize social conditions, but rather create an environment where the rights of everyone are respected and public space remains dedicated to the public. For example, removing old phone booths and street encampments, uh, not privatizing lighter air, prohibiting cars and delivery trucks from double parking, discouraging pedestrians from walking in the bike lanes and keeping the cyclists from ride, riding on the sidewalk. On the economic and development and, and recovery- Open streets, restaurants love it, all around Harlem, right? DOT did it at the request of the community. The community said everybody was for it uh, within five minutes, five minutes, because the fireworks went on. Somebody fire. needs to mute Gail for oh, Gail. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so on the economic development and recovery, uh, we really want commercial tenant programs, grants and loans to recover from the pandemic, particularly in the theatrical art arena. Grants, loans and marketing support will really be needed to help Broadway recover which, because they're not gonna be operational for, as we know, for quite a while. And we're also advocating for a number of items for our schools. For example, smart boards at Clinton, uh, computers for the School of Future, uh, and, and uh, items for, for wireless at the Baruch Campus High School, a new playground, equipment for PS340. We're also advocating for the funds for the Bleecker School site. And that's not in our district, but it's gonna serve the children of all of Manhattan. So, so we really don't wanna lose this opportunity. Um, on the open streets, I'm not gonna uh, repeat what was said, but I echo the concerns that Tammy and Carter mentioned. Uh, we're hearing that also. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, that's CB5, so thank you. Thank you, CB6, Kyle. Yep. Uh, so many issues uh, that are similar to the rest of the community boards as well. Um, the public has, you know, expressed concern about temporary shelters in the neighborhood as well. Uh, we will also be discussing the expansion of city bike in the district. So we'll be talking about that um, at our next transportation meeting. Um, we also put together our district needs statements. So we'll talk with the borough president's office about that in further detail and um, at our next meeting as well. Um, big things that um, are most immediate, uh, we were dealing with a pretty significant sinkhole situation by the 34th Street heliport. I am happy to report that DOT has been pretty responsive um, to those issues and evaluating uh, the sinkholes and the structural issues with that. And so we've been able to uh, mitigate traffic in that area and are working with them to make that process more efficient. Uh, other main issue is the ESCR. Um, Asser Levy uh, will be shut down starting tomorrow. Um, we didn't really have much notice on that. Um, so that is something of concern to us. Um, it is scheduled to be closed until around 2021. Um, the handball court and the rec center will still be open, but the playground itself will be, uh, be redone. Um, so we're gonna keep pushing on increasing communication uh, with the whole ESCR process, um, because that has been a huge concern uh, with the local community is making sure that these updates are being done in a open and transparent way and ensuring that the local community is aware of all these updates, even though outreach has been conducted in the past, uh, as we know, uh, a lot more <laughs> needs to be done on that. So we're gonna continue to push on that as well. And that's what I have for CB6. Thank you very, thank you very much, um, CB7, Mark Diller. Uh, good morning, thank you. Um, we too have been through our district needs um, and budget priorities statements, um, and, and there's a lot of overlap with what Craig was saying and others as well. Um, we were trying to focus as much as possible on the impacts of COVID on a variety of community resources. And I think we are, our, our priorities reflect that, um, first and foremost with food insecurity, uh, an issue that, um, that everyone has to confront. Um, and uh, of course, with respect to the need to address um, the needs that are presented both by street and by shelter homeless. Um, uh, and Craig uh, summarized that really quite well. So thank you for that. Um, uh, there are also um, issues that sort of evade data collection, but still are perceptions and constituent complaints re relating to the senses of safety and security. Um, that, uh, that the crime data doesn't necessarily capture. And so we're trying to pay uh, close attention to some of those things as well. 
um, among our top, uh, uh, our very top uh, capital uh, priority is NYCHA. Um, and of course, that is an, an, a never ending conversation and, a, and, a, and a, a sinkhole of its own, if you'll pardon the um, borrowing of a phrase. Um, it's something that, that uh, we try to get our hands around um, and also to be supportive of our NYCHA neighbors. Um, in that regard, I would welcome anybody's thoughts on yet another series of NYCHA buildings in our district. These are smaller scale buildings who've been without um, cooking gas for some number of weeks already. And with um, the winter coming on and of course a holiday, of, uh, a holiday or holidays coming up, um, the inability to cook in one's home uh, takes on even uh, greater uh, significance. I'll be, uh, I'll be writing a letter about that today, but, um, but um, writing letters sometimes is just a symbolic gesture as opposed to a means to an end. So I would welcome anybody's thoughts offline about um, uh, how we can actually bring pressure to bear to make that happen uh, and to restore the actual service. Um, the outdoor dining and the, uh, the, the need to strike a balance between keeping our small businesses afloat and the concerns for safety and security uh, with respect to these increasingly large structures that are in our roadbed and I, I understand in other districts on the sidewalk um, is, a, is a real concern. Um, we want to be supportive, but also uh, appropriate to the, to the rules. Um, we are highlighting a, a concern with respect to, um, and, and perhaps today is, uh, uh, it's, it's ironic that I'm mentioning this today, the day that the De Department of Education has closed schools. Um, we are made aware that, um, that a lot of stakeholders are not involved in the conversations um, or, or final decision making. Um, I, we're gratified that the UFT is at the table, um, but in particular, the principals union does not seem to be at the table. And these are the folks to whom all of these policy instructions are given um, in broad language and then required to translate into actual um, procedures and, and safety uh, implementation. So we are um, following that. Uh, we also believe strongly that the CECs and the parent voice needs to be at that table as well. Um, I think if you listen to any media today, you'll hear parent voices uh, expressing concern both as to the substance of a decision made to close the schools and the manner in which it was arrived at. Um, uh, and finally, with thanks to the borough president's office, we're continuing to, to follow um, a potential where um, um, affordable housing bonuses are appear to be double dipping. We don't know whether that's the case or not, but we're grateful that uh, Lizette and April and Connor and the team from the borough president's office is helping us try to unravel that. We wanna make sure that, that when bonuses are awarded, that they are awarded and used in the way in which they were intended. I'll leave it at that and thank you very much for the time. Alita, CB8. Thanks, Rosie. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we have this major issue with the blood center. There is a flood of not-for-profits believing that because they work for the community good, they can get whatever they want from zoning, whatever changes, no matter how dramatic, no matter how much they impact the neighborhood. The blood center is a little bit different because they will only occupy about a third of a building that's being funded by a for-profit life sciences developer. So it, we had a zoning meeting the other night and a, over 300 members of the community showed up for the zoning meeting, um, many of whom were in, uh, well, a majority of whom were in opposition to the blood center. So that's a big issue for us. Kohler Hospital on Roosevelt Island, we're really concerned. It's a nursing home. A lot of people there have been injured and are disabled from, uh, from violence and depend, uh, they're independent thinkers and doers, but because of COVID, they are really limited in what they can do. And we're concerned about a surge in infections already. Um, I think this week I've heard that three staff members have COVID. So it's a big concern for us. The last infection um, in the spring when it all started, they used half of the facility as overflow from the hospitals and there were a lot of infections. Uh, so we're really um, concerned about that. The last or the only bank on Roosevelt Island moved off of Roosevelt Island, leaving in its wake two ATMs that only do withdrawals. So nobody on Roosevelt Island has access to a bank and it's a, 
it's also of great concern to us because there are a lot of senior citizens, disabled people, and Cornell Tech is there without a credit union also. So thank you, Gail, for your help and for um, your staff and to Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright for working hard on this issue. Um, bike lanes on 61st and 62nd Street, on the way to the Queensboro Bridge, on streets that are already highly congested, there are hospitals around there, um, are a major concern to the community. We've also had many people show up on that. Um, and then for CB6, we've had sinkholes in the Esplanade, so maybe there's a trend among sinkholes to just appear along the East River, which is a major thing. And then finally, um, for landmarks, we'll be writing to the Landmarks Preservation Commission asking for um, more community input into and notice of staff level decisions. Um, although we met with Sarah Carroll and, and her staff early in the fall, um, and she told us that no more um, landmarks, no greater number of landmarks issues are going to staff level than have ever been. We, we seem to see that we're not having access to information about it or any input. So we're going to be writing a letter about that. Thank you so much, Rosie and Gail, and uh, it's good to see everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, stay safe. Uh, thank you, Alita. And I also understand that you've been term limited. So is this your last meeting or will no, it be I next I month? I would have said so next month. Great. So then uh, we get to share another meeting together. Yes. Um, just calling just in case someone showed up. CB9. Okay. Um, CB10, Cecily. Hello everyone, uh, Cicely Harris, CB10. Um, just a few updates. So the good thing about going last is that uh, a lot of things have already been said, so that cuts down on what I'm gonna say. But we did have the Harlem Holiday Light Celebration yesterday, brought to us by the 125th Street Bid, CB9 participated, and Street Corner Resources, one of our Cure Violence groups participated. So we had a very small caravan of floats that went on a um, route throughout Harlem just to spread holiday cheer and just a feeling of love and connecting with our community, something that we all need right now. So we were very excited about that. I want to also thank the Manhattan Borough President's Office, um, Athena and Madam Borough President, for hosting the Harlem Holiday Lakes reception virtually, virtually this time on Monday. Um, I believe it was like 60 to 70 people that were able to log in and Zoom and just celebrate um, the holiday season as it comes, which is really, really important right now just to bring that extra bit of cheer. Um, so really quick on some quick issues, COVID-19 measures. Um, we have had three calls um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday with elected officials. So we, we thank you all for, for organizing those calls. What we are asking for as a board, as an area that has been hard, heavy hit by COVID-19 is up-to-date reports on our zip codes, by zip codes. So we can target those zip codes with PPE and alert the community to what needs to be done. We're doing all these efforts right now, but it's helpful to have real-time information to inform the community. So we are continuing that ask. Also, um, City bikes, filling your pain on city bikes. We were fed, fed the same line about a contract and that needed to be upheld. It's unfortunate that we are beholden to the dollar at this point and not the community. And that's what we wanted to really highlight with DOT. We appreciate their uh, partnership and telling us things. But when you tell us things like that, it's really hard to swallow when we're here um, just to try to, uh, you know, um, raise a voice for our community. Also, um, Open streets, again, feeling your uh, concern on that. We've had a lot of community concern. Um, and again, we just want, uh, I guess all the CMB uh, chairs want just to be involved from the beginning. It's hard to do things when you're bought in at the end of the process, the community is already up in arms and you, it puts us in a really bad position, um, trying to give information, but also trying to work out a solution that we weren't involved in in the beginning. So. Um, um, it's it's been a real hassle. We've had a lot of things coming up um, in that area. Um, so we just want to make sure that it's not too late <laughs> to change the process so that we can be involved from the beginning. Um, and 
I know it does seem like uh, voting just happened a really long time ago with all these things coming up, but I did want to thank all the um, elected officials for coming out to our polls, making sure that people were fed and kept warm and passing out supplies to make sure that people stayed in those long lines and got the job done. So thank you so much. And yes, happy holidays. Thank you, Cecily. Um, and now we'll move on to the Borough President's Report. Madam Borough President. Thank you very much, everybody, for all your work. So a couple of things. First of all, this public realm czar is becoming increasingly important. I heard some of you talk about, you know, give us some information early on, give us uh, the opportunity when these restaurants have built to have them continue. And I'm on the other line with DOB, DOT regarding, is this a canopy? Is this scaffolding? Is this allowed? And I could go on and on. We have got to find somebody to do this job. And of course, um, there really are 21 agencies involved with your street. So just so you know, I am, we're working on a massive letter. We'll get your input. And Tim Tompkins and MAS deserve the credit for thinking of this, but it is increasingly evident, just FYI. Um, and I don't know how I'm gonna deal with this other problem, but I'm trying. The issue of COVID. So um, much thanks to the uh, discussion. I know that 10040 is the highest in Manhattan, but we're all creeping up there. Um, today, in a few minutes, I'm going to 10040, but not to say there aren't similar situations. I think we're going to do the first. It's a micro testing pop up. We're going to be right on the street. We've been trained as to how to do it. Um, we're going to be there uh, for a couple hours this afternoon, right in front of a store that has allowed us to be there. And it's the first, uh, I think, micro testing site because we need this everywhere. And we'll see if we can do it uh, even cold or not. We're going to just do it and then we will see if we can do it elsewhere. We need the, uh, the partners to help us. We need rapid testing in the hottest zip codes and we need it now. So we're also doing a letter. Uh, signed particularly by the Upstown electeds and certainly the community boards, if you want to say to the hospitals and to the health centers, you may be doing something, but you need to do a lot more. And that's um, just an example of what we're trying. We also give out PPE as you do. Um, yesterday we did board nine, um, walking up and down Broadway um, with a red, rag, red, red wagon that the chair came up with. Um, and we were swamped with need for, you know, uh, sanitizer and masks. So it, it's needed. Um, we've also done all the food distributions. We did one yesterday at 120th Street. Um, and there were tons of people who need food and we know that. Schools, what a friggin' mess. I think I used that word a long time ago. In addition to what Mark Diller mentioned, I just wanna say how irritated I am about the following. So we have about, I don't know, $15 million sitting in the bank from last year. And we finally got OMB to sign off on it. It's mostly for technology. It's mostly for devices. It's mostly to help with the crisis that we face. Without getting into all the specifics, it's very nuanced, but between the school construction authority, because we're not doing what I consider carts. Well, those of you who have kids in the school, you know, you unlock the closet, I've done this. You take the cart out normally. You take out the laptops that are in the cart. At the end of the class, you put the laptop back in the cart and you put it in the closet. It makes me nuts. Of course, all the charter school kids come in with their little laptops. So we're trying to do the laptops. We got Directive 10, controller's office changed. I, this was my advocacy for many years so that we could buy the laptops. Again, phone books, anything but the cart that I just described. But guess what? Turns out you need to have, not only do you need SCA, but you have to have the school pay for the cover for the laptop, who knew? And it, without that, and other aspects of what they want the uh, school to do in terms of costs, you need certain kinds of sign-offs by SCA, which are not necessary for the insurance sign-offs, which are not necessary if you have the laptop in the cart. Without getting, again, really frustrating, we're stuck. So we're gonna keep fussing, well, I have to get SCA to change their position and I have to get the city to pick up. Somebody else, school should not be paying for the liability insurance and the cover. It should be coming out of Reso A funding. So I just want to let you know, I still haven't been able to spend this gazillion dollars yet. Um, and I hope that you are paying attention to the uh, learning bridges, seeing if they're working, 
working with the CECs. I also want to thank all the CECs. They are working incredibly hard. Uh, Pam Stewart, who's head of Community Board 5, just so you know, is a real superstar. She just gave up with the work waiting for DOE. So she has started her own GoFund. And she has, I put in money, others put in money, Hazel Dukes put in a lot of money. And that particular CEC is just buying uh, laptops for the kids. And um, it's going quite well. She's figuring out who really needs one and she is just buying them. So, um, one example of somebody who took initiative, not to say that others aren't doing amazing things. Um, we are working just like everybody else, talking about food on all the uh, turkeys. Rosalba Rodriguez from our office is coordinating it. We had a great as I said, uh, working with Hunts Point Market yesterday, they're doing all five boroughs and they were incredibly generous yesterday. Um, in terms of housing, uh, thanks to Athena Moore on the 23rd of November, which is next week, Monday night, I think we're doing at six o'clock, it will be on our newsletter and in our web uh, website, a really fantastic discussion of tenant rights, something that um, is gonna be coming increasingly important as the uh, eviction moratorium looks to be ending at some point next year. And I can't say how important it is because you know. Um, uh, helicopters, April Adams is working on this. I think they're coming from New Jersey. We're putting together a task force. April knows what we're working on with the New Jersey folks. What's strange is the New Jersey folks don't seem to have any noise complaints. We're swamped. Um, and so I guess what happens is they find a way to skirt all the cities in New Jersey and come right across the river and start their noise in the borough of Manhattan. I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but we'll figure it out. That's, uh, we do have some still coming from downtown Heliport. We've written to the former Mayor Bloomberg and this Mayor de Blasio asking to cut out all tourism from downtown. We have not been successful, but just so you know, we're still focused on helicopters. I think Westchester, um, also has a, a helicopter coming out of the White Plains. We're trying to figure out how many of them are coming down to uh, our borough. Um, in terms of land use, it is incredibly busy. I think you know this, you heard some of the discussions, but just to give you an example of some of the ones that we're working on, obviously Soho, NoHo, obviously Lenox Hill Hospital, obviously Governor's Island, um, 250 and all of the issues, Water Street or the alternative and what we're going to do about the South Street Seaport Museum and the Seaport in general. East Midtown, um, one Vanderbilt I think was successful and the East Midtown planning has been successful, but the um, issue of, but the issue of um, all the ones in the, in the pipeline, we know about JP Morgan, there's the MTA building, the Hyatt is coming down. And certainly um, the Roosevelt Hotel is a question mark, but I'm sure they'll find something. Um, child care cuts, um, we're working on a letter about that. Manhattan got screwed in terms of those that need that kind of service. It is certainly not applicable to just have pre-K. You don't have after school, I could go on and on, but we got a major cut in Manhattan. The um, dollars went elsewhere. Um, that whether it is ACS or DOE, they don't understand that there are lots of uh, pockets of poverty. So when you start cutting, even though it looks high income on a map, it is not high income when you start looking at the micro and the NYCHA and the other in the neighborhood. Plus people work in Manhattan and they have to be able to bring their kids closer to their jobs. So we are getting screwed and we're focused on that. On the census, I just, I'm on the board of the National League of Cities. And it was a great map the other day that uh, was shown to us because what it showed is all your hard work paid off. The map was interesting to me. The cities in the country, not all of them, most of the blue state cities, to be honest with you, had huge um, sort of positive arrows that said, you worked hard and you counted people. The rural areas were totally red, which meant bad things in this case, I guess generally in the map world that we look at on the uh, CNN and MSNBC, but it meant that there was no money put into rural areas in terms of the count and the census. Well, that was an interesting map. I'll get you copies of it. I was surprised that um, we all thought that, you know, no matter how hard we tried, and goodness knows we did, we couldn't get people to fill out that survey. Well, guess what? In the rural areas, they didn't even try. I know this came up earlier about the uh, elections, but schools, understandably, do not want to be early voting sites. So we're gonna work with the you and the uh, Board of Elections for next year, but they are 
got to find other locations. Um, I know that Cynthia Doty, who is the uh, Manhattan staff member at the Board of Elections tried really hard, but we've got to find other locations. So all suggestions will be welcome. So that's my report and I wanna thank all of you. I look forward to continuing all the fabulous work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Gail. I, I don't wanna sc scroll through everything. Is um, council member uh, ben Kalo still on? Of course. Okay, there you go. Um, you can give your report. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. It's at Ben Kalos on Twitter. Pandora, my cat, doesn't have a Twitter handle, uh, but she loves these meetings and so do I. Uh, it's hard to, as I think Cicely mentioned, it's hard to imagine that, we just, that election day was so recently, uh, especially since we try to live through 2020. There were ridiculous lines on election day. And it's because of broken state laws, a corrupt board of elections. Uh, there is something you can do about it as community board chairs. And I, I am begging and pleading, uh, work with us, uh, your elected officials with Gail Brewer to identify locations for early voting, whether it's cultural institutions, faith-based institutions. We're asking for about 10, 20 days a year minimum, sometimes more with special elections that they can make their doors open, the city will pay them. Uh, but I'm hoping that we can set up task forces and every single community board uh, to identify locations so that ahead of the June uh, 2021 elections, which are going to be bananas, I believe there are 300 candidates running, we will hopefully see turnout like we've never seen before. Um, we can avoid people having to wait hours in line and being angry at everyone versus just identifying the locations, flagging the cultural institutions or faith-based institutions that aren't paying taxes and aren't doing their part, we can put pressure on them to do the right thing. And if the Board of Elections is refusing to use the sites, uh, please let me know, let Gail know, we will, we will take them on, but we need to identify the locations. Uh, so uh, quick, can I see a show of hands? Anyone interested in making voting better, elections better, and helping fix our democracy. Okay, April, Craig, and Tammy, I will be in touch. Um, as we face the uh, pandemic uh, and, and a, a second wave, uh, we did a hearing on the 90-day stockpile. Uh, the city hadn't re uh, released it. Um, what we discovered is we have 3.5 million and 95 masks. I don't know if it's enough. I think it's based on faulty data. Uh, I've shared this with Gotham Gazette. If we have any doctors, if there's a doctors in the house and they, uh, th the sad part is in government and ele amongst elected officials, we don't have any public health experts. We don't have anyone with a public health degree. Uh, so if folks have ideas, please let me know. I, I will say one of the things we are fighting is that the nurses and doctors from public hospital said, why are we buying N95 masks? They leave marks on your face, they can leave scarring. They're asking for something called elastrometric uh, respirators, uh, which are just like kind of the, the Darth Vader mask things, um, actually more like Bane from Batman. Uh, so it would be far less and less expensive and we're just trying to get that done. Along the same lines, um, as we're trying to recover from this pandemic, uh, there's a lot of folks talking about what does what the new normal work look like? And I hear a lot of folks talking about how do we bail out uh, big corporations, uh, as we saw with the PPP, uh, in this hope of like trickle down economics from the Reagan era that just doesn't work. So I proposed legislation for a worker led recovery. Uh, what that would mean is we would actually pay uh, about 200, 300,000 human service workers a prevailing wage. And uh, for all those folks who've been on the front lines helping our neediest all this time, we'd actually pay them. Speaking of paying them, uh, all of you have nonprofits in your communities that in July got a letter from Mayor de Blasio saying, we are cutting you for last year and we're cutting you moving forward. Uh, the city had agreed to cover indirect rates, whether that's heat, light, and power, uh, anything that isn't direct service to clients. And the city said, you know what, we're gonna start covering that because everyone else we cover their overhead. And so after a year in, they said, oh, we're going to cut you back. And so for some of these, some of these nonprofits, we're talking about millions of dollars. 
Uh, we're having a hearing on this on uh, uh, November 25th, the day before Thanksgiving, so we can talk about the mayor's cuts to those providing food to our hungry uh, right before Thanksgiving. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I know Mark, uh, CB6, you were talking about food access. We can't have food access if we don't pay the nonprofits who do the work. So we'd love to have CB6 there if possible. Uh, on the issue of laptops, uh, Gail Brewer and I uh, fight uh, over who can buy technology for schools in my district. And uh, she's been incredible about getting the laptops throughout the city. The issue being that when the pandemic struck, all the schools that we supported were able to send kids homes with laptops. Uh, the mayor decided to just buy everyone iPads at twice the rate of what you could get them in a store. And now as we head into this school year, there's 77,000 students, particularly children, low income children in communities of color who still don't have laptops. And as of today, we're remote again, and they still don't have laptops. Uh, so I've introduced legislation with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer uh, and, and a whole slew of other elected officials from all over the city to guarantee every student a laptop with internet and culturally responsive digital textbooks uh, that for, for my hope wouldn't just be about white men in history, but would actually like talk about our shared cultural history uh, across time and space. Uh, on learning bridges, I, I asked the mayor to do these remote learning centers. He's been messing it up since day one. Uh, we got one location, 60 seats on the Upper East Side to serve 4,000 students. Uh, about two weeks ago, we did a rally on Roosevelt Island where they were being asked to commute 45 minutes in each direction. And we were proud to announce we now have 200 seats on Roosevelt Island, so 260 seats for 4,000 kids. Uh, but we're gonna keep fighting and hope to work with anyone who needs it. On Roosevelt Island, uh, we saw one of the banks close. And so we've already reached out to, I think, uh, about a dozen different banks to see if we can bring them back. Uh, we also have outreach to the state banking division and uh, we're working with our borough president, Gail Brewer, on bringing banking back to uh, Roosevelt Island. Uh, and in the, just I want to talk about the environment because we're talking about pandemic, but like climate change is still a thing. It's still coming and uh, we need to do something soon. Uh, the reusable, ba uh, the, 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 the bag fee is now in place. You may be noticing you're getting paper bags. Uh, we have free reusable bags. Um, if Gail Brewer will give me some with her name on it, I'd love to get those to hand out, but we're being giving those away. Um, we have access through Department of Sanitation, any community board that's interested in doing these bag giveaways, we'd like to help and support you in that um, and make sure people have access. Uh, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, we're gonna be giving away uh, turkeys as we always do to public housing residents. If you need access to turkeys, please let us know. And I just wanna thank all of you uh, because as, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for this opportunity and I'm also thankful for the partnership that we have with every single one of you on the great work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, council member. I don't see, but I'll just call. I know Mark Levine was on earlier, um, but I don't see him in the participant list now. Okay, great. So uh, now we're at that point of the meeting. Um, can I yes. interrupt and ask something? It, do you have anyone there who could do an implicit bias training? I'd really like to do that before my term ends for the board. And the people I've contacted all charge a lot. So I'm wondering if the borough president's office has. And also I'd like to urge a rank choice voting programs to start around Manhattan if that comes into effect in the primary. And also to mention that CB8 and CB10 are working on a program on the economic impacts of gentrification if any other boards are interested in, uh, in, in working with us. So thank you for letting me interrupt and I'm so sorry to take up more time. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. So um, what we're asking is for boards to attend the uh, Commission on Human Rights training that our office is co-hosting with them first. Um, so while we get someone to do this implicit bias, bias training, um, we were supposed to do trainings in November, but the um, workshop is being tweaked a little bit since it ran really long the last time. And I've worked out with the Commission on Human Rights. We're gonna have 
an option to attend a Saturday and a Sunday training as long as well as some weeknights. But those trainings are now going to happen in um, in January and February. Um, in the interim, we're going to be doing other trainings uh, for the new board members. Um, some of the core trainings like resolution writing. Um, Alita, maybe you and I can speak offline. Um, I, I don't know that it's going to happen before um, before your your while you're still chair. So, uh, but we'll see what we can do about that. Um, so, having said that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Rosie, this I, had, I had another quick question. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. Just, uh, I, I had forgotten to bring this up, but this is relevant to all boards. Um, we are only able to conduct one meeting at a time for our community board, and we're we're starting to have a lot of meetings happen. Uh, and we're just wondering for the Zoom accounts if there's an opportunity that there's a way to figure out you know, if there's a spillover account or something that we might be able to use or other boards could use so that we can conduct multiple meetings in a night at the same time. So uh -oh. I just wanted to put that out there. We will, we will find a way, Rosie, because I know other groups are doing it because I'm on so many Zooms. Um, it's possible to do it. So yes, we'll figure it out, Carter, because I've seen other groups doing it now because of the same problem. Great, thanks. Sorry to interrupt. I'll no, it's a good idea. It's a very good idea. It's, it's a very good question. Thank you, Carter. Okay, so before I, I, I see the council member has his hand up. Uh, I wanted to just echo something that CBA Chair Lady Camp brought up, which is the blood center. There's a scoping session on December 15th. The reason it may matter to every community board in this list is the blood center is a nonprofit which is proposing to sell their land, transfer it to a, a for-profit developer. Uh, change the zoning in a RAB 75 foot height capped neighborhood and uh, increase the height to 330 feet in a 75 foot district. And then uh, in so doing, remove light from the only park in the 60s. So um, it, it, I think one thing the borough president has been dealing with is a lot of air rights transfers between faith based organizations and, and for profit entities. but. This, this would set a precedence that any nonprofit could sell their land up zone and uh, remove the nonprofit use uh, from the community. So that is just something to think about or, or it might be the right thing to do, but I just wanted to put it out there as something folks should be thinking about in the same way as we're thinking about Governor's Island as a city. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, any other questions? Having no. uh, seen that there are no other hands up, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So Second. Aye. Okay, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, anyone abstaining or no, who wants, wants to, to stay on the meeting? Everybody has something Aye, else everybody. to do. <laughs> Meeting's Aye. officially over. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, thank you, thank you.